This is the SIGGRAPH Fundamental Seminar, which is really meant for absolutely everyone, uh, regardless of how much or how little experience you have with computer graphics. We really want to take it upon ourselves to make sure you have a good time at the conference. And so that's why this is here. And all of these notes are on a website. If you go to the website, you'll find PDFs of all of these slides in both one slide per page, two per page, and six per page formats. Feel free to use them if you're teaching a course or if you're explaining things to your colleagues back at work. Feel free to use them. We, that is me and SIGGRAPH, would very much like you to take advantage of this as much as you can. Also on that website is a list of references. And these are references that I've been collecting over the years. They're ones that I know to be good. There's a lot of really good books out there that are not in that reference list. Um, and there's probably a lot of books there I don't know about because I haven't been to the SIGGRAPH bookstore yet. But you will find a lot of um, references there. All right, so let's get started. Here are the goals for the seminar. This is really to give you a background for everything else you're going to see at SIGGRAPH. Um, you're going to see a lot of things. You're going to see hardware and software and animation and imagery. And so we would like you to understand what it takes to put some of that together and what it takes to, to really appreciate um, what people had to do with it. We're going to give you an understanding of some of the common computer graphics vocabulary. Generally at SIGGRAPH, people don't go to great lengths to explain the jargon. They just use it because they've done it for so long. They forget that it's jargon. But we'll cover that here. Um, you'll see a lot of imagery, and I'll explain some of the ways that imagery gets put together. We'll talk about the exhibition. The exhibition is huge, and you really need a strategy if you want to get the most out of it. And then, of course, as I said, on the website, there are a list of references. All right, let me introduce myself. My name's Mike Bailey. I'm a professor of computer science. Stop it. Um, at Oregon State University. And I've been in computer graphics and have been coming to SIGGRAPH well for quite some time. Um, and this is the absolute best thing you can do. This is summer at its very best is to spend a week around all these other people that are excited about computer graphics. I, I look forward to this every year. So there's my email address, and you'll have it too if you, if you look at the notes. Feel free to send me emails if there's anything I or the conference can do to help you. All right, so here's our schedule. We, we'll, ah, we'll stick to this somewhat. Um, we'll talk about how to attend SIGGRAPH. I have some strategic recommendations for you. We'll talk about the graphics process, and that's where we'll get into some of the jargon, some of the terminology. I'm not quite sure what to do here. Let's kind of see how this goes. There's a section on understanding graphics hardware. I had originally designed this to be three hours or two and a half, and then it got put into a one and a half hour time slot. So then I was thinking, well, maybe I'll just leave this in the notes but not talk about it. But boy, I hate not to talk about it. So I think I'm going to talk about it, but maybe just go a little faster. Um, we'll talk about modeling, rendering, and animation. Those are really the three legs of the stool for doing computer graphics, is modeling to make geometry, rendering to make pictures of it, and animation to make it move. And we'll look at some ways that that takes place. All right, let's start with how to attend a SIGGRAPH. All right, you're here. That's a very good start. Thanks for doing that. Okay, one of the things you'll realize, or have realized if you've looked through the schedule, is SIGGRAPH is like a 10-ring circus is there are so many things and they're all going on in parallel. And if you've gone to smaller conferences, other conferences don't do that. They do things in serial so you can actually see everything that's going on if you want to. In SIGGRAPH you can't, okay? And you just got to accept that as, being, as part of being here. But what it means is you need a strategy. And I'll show you what I did, and it took me several years to evolve this, is for every day, I make a little chart, and here are the times of day, and then I go through the, the schedule, the, the, the little schedule booklet you got when you registered, and find the things I really want to see. And I write them down. But notice for every time slot, there's oftentimes more than one thing. 
And you really want to do that because a lot of times you'll say, oh, this looks like a great session, I love the name. And then you'll get in there and you'll realize it's not what you expected. In order to get the most from the conference, what you need is a quick alternative. Okay, pull out the schedule. What else would I want to see right now? I'll quick run over there. That is what you don't want to do is pull out the locator and start looking at every individual thing you could go do because you're going to waste 10 or 15 minutes doing that. What you want is to make an instant decision. Okay, I'm going to go over to this other room and see something. I tend, I, I, I'm much more anal about this than anybody really should be. I don't recommend being quite this anal, but I also color code it. Ooh, this one looks really good, that sort of thing. Um, and this was early on as I was looking through the locator. So yeah, so, so this, this is mine <laughs> for the week. Um, okay, so I'll admit the analness. My Wednesday is, really sucks. Okay, Wednesday's gonna be a very busy, confusing day. Okay, now one of the things you don't see in this schedule is a box for lunch. And of course, that's tough. Who wants to go without lunch? But as you know, eating in a convention center, the lines are long, the prices are steep, and SIGGRAPH doesn't stop for lunch. All through the schedule this week, you'll see things going on over the lunch hour. Really good talks you want to go to. So here's what I do, and again, this is maybe more anal than anyone has a right to be, is on the way in in the morning, I stop by one of the hundred subways in the five block area around my hotel and pick up lunch, carry it around, and then I can, if I want to, then I can go to a lunchtime session and be eating lunch at the same time. Again, what you don't want to do is miss something that's really important to you, that's really important to your interests, that's really important to your job. You just don't want to miss it. And it happens a lot. It happens a lot you get back to your place of work and you're looking through the SIGGRAPH schedule because you're telling someone about it and you go, oh my God, I missed that. And that's just, just horrifying. So again, get the most out of this you can. <laughs> like, like they like to say around here, you can sleep next week. <laughs> All right, the exhibition. This is a map of the SIGGRAPH 2014 exhibition. And you think, oh my God, how am I gonna handle that? What do I need to do? Well, first of all, we need to break it down into what is this actually telling you? What this is telling you is where all the vendors are. So for instance, AMD, I just picked one, is right here. And if you look at the chart, you can see it in little letters, AMD, but you're actually not supposed to look at this chart, okay? But I wanna use the chart to explain the booth numbers. Okay, here's how, the, here's how the booth numbers work. For instance, AMD is booth number 1023. It looks like an arbitrary number, but it's not. It's a Cartesian coordinate, okay? The first two digits are the aisle number. All the aisles are numbered in order, and there's usually banners hanging above the aisle so you know which aisle you're in. The 23, <laughs> You multiply that by five, and that's the number of feet from the front of the room. Why? Well, otherwise you'd end up with a big number. They wanted it to be a two-digit number, okay? So if we go back to this, 23 times five is 115. It's 115 feet from here back to there. Okay, it's a Cartesian coordinate system. X and Y tells you exactly how to find each booth. And, and of course, I don't, I don't want to see any of you out there pacing it off. Okay, don't do that. That would just embarrass me because everyone will know I told you to do it. Okay, what I'd like you to do is if you look at the booth where the, the booth and the carpet kind of meet, they've got a sign right there on the floor that tells you the booth number. So if you're looking for booth 23 and you're standing there and you look down at the sign and it says 20, it means you haven't gone far enough. Okay, so do not pace this off. But this helps. And here's, and again, being more anal about this than most people, here's what I do is I go through the list of vendors and I write down the ones I've got to see. I try and see everything. I go up and down every aisle. But here's the problem. 
not all the aisles go through. Vendors are allowed to reserve a booth on each side of the aisle and then collapse them into one booth, thus blocking the aisle. And so now you think you're going down the aisle, but now you're blocked by a booth and you have to go around it. And as you go around it, you lose track of where you are or you get distracted by something and now you miss something that was on the other side of the booth, okay? What I do is make a list of the vendors that I know I've got to see with their booth numbers. Then I sort the list by booth number. And now as I'm out there on the floor, I'm just ticking them off. And if I get to aisle 10, but I somehow haven't seen booth 938, I know that I've missed it. And I've got to go back and figure out where the topology of the, of the exhibit floor changed and how did I miss it. So again, optimize your time, optimize your effort. There is too much to see for any one person. Just make sure you do the very best for what you're interested in. Yeah, so there's aisle 10. But again, you'll see banners up in the air. All right, let's talk about the graphics process. If you take a computer graphics course, like a university course or maybe the OpenGL course here, this is what you'll see, is you'll see this pipeline diagram Model coordinates come in one way and different steps happen to it, and then pixels come out the other end. And this is correct, and it's all very interesting if you'd like to understand it at, at that level. But what I'd like to do is look at the graphics process at a different level. I'd like to say, here are the things that you typically want to have happen. There are certain pieces to this, and whoa, out the back end comes an animated, cool-looking display. How do we get from nothing to that? Okay, so we're going to look at each piece. And then we're going to, later on, we're going to come back and do more detail on modeling, rendering, and the animation pieces. All right, let's start at the left-hand end. I can see this is going to plague me the whole time. Um, the geometric modeling, and as you can see, that's an input to just about the whole thing. Geometric modeling is the act of using mathematics to describe geometry. And look at the world around you. We live in a geometry world, a 3D world, from podiums to chairs to rooms to convention centers to ships to airplanes, okay? And that's all well and good, but if you want to do computer graphics of those things, somebody has to put in some equations or some data that describes that to the computer. The computer does not know what a podium looks like. It does not know what a chair looks like all by itself. You have to tell it, okay? And there's a lot of techniques for doing that. And again, we'll come back to the modeling in more detail and look at some of those techniques. But it's extremely important. And then the other nice thing about the modeling, well, maybe the nice thing, maybe the pressure-packed thing, is also you can use it for a certain amount of simulation. For instance, I don't know, who, who has seen Guardians of the Galaxy? Yes. Of course this group would be mostly Guardians of the Galaxy cognizant. Um, there's a lot of things that blow up in Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Well, that's part of the geometric modeling is you model things to look like what they really are, but you model them in a certain way that the pieces are separable. So that when you're doing a, a, an animation of an explosion, those separal pe separable pieces can fly apart. Now, one of the problems with coming to SIGGRAPH, one of the problems with becoming familiar with how these things have to happen, is you'll never watch a movie the same way again. You know, my, it drives my kids crazy. They watch me in the movie theater and I'll lean over and I'll whisper, whoa, great smoke, you know, great fur. And I'll say, oh, shut up. <laughs> yeah, the raccoon, the raccoon in Guardians of the Galaxy was really, really well done. So again, if you don't know what all this means, go see the movie. Um, so anyway, so lots of ways of doing 3D modeling. One way people do it is they do 3D scanning. You'll see 3D scanners on the exhibition floor take an object, put it in the scanner, lasers go around it, and you end up with a 3D model. That's, that's, that's cool. It's not foolproof. 
know, it can't see through things. It can't see inside. You have to model that separately. But it is a way of getting a, a shape on the outside. And yes, of course, you can do faces that way too. Although they never turn out quite like you want them to. They look more like death masks. But you can do that. People will use interactive software. You know, at the bottom end, things like SketchUp, Moving Up, Blender, Maya, CAD systems. Lots of things out there. You'll see a lot of this on the show floor. There's a lot of companies that have started up doing geometric modeling. You can buy models. You know, there's these companies that do a lot of digitizing then sell them. Their catalogs are wonderful to look at. You know, there's, there's pages and pages of airplanes and ships and cars and trucks and human organs. And it's pretty much any human organ you want. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like my college students. They're thinking, surely he doesn't mean they have a model of one of those, whatever that means to you. And the answer is yes, they do. It's in the catalog. You can see it. Why? I have no idea. All right, animation definition. Things move. Sometimes they move according to the way we want them to. That is, I'm animating this object. You notice I was not even touching it then. If I'm animating this object, I might want it here, and then 10 seconds later, I want it there in a different place and a different orientation. How do we do that? Well, there's ways of doing that. There's ways of smoothly interpolating what I want to have happen. This is known as keyframe animation. Um, a lot of times, we drive animations with physics. F equals MA for all you physics fans. That is, I might say, this has a certain mass, and I'm gonna push on it with a certain force, or maybe there's a spring attached from here to the wall, and I'm gonna let it go. And if I solve the equations of physics, it'll just move on its own. And then there's some interesting variations on that that I'll show you when we get to the animation part that I think you'll, you'll really like. There's also motion capture. One of the things you'll see on the show floor are vendors that make camera systems. They put cameras around on a floor, and then they put little bright ping pong balls all over a person. It's actually a suit you put on that has ping pong balls on it. And then they dance around. And the cameras from multiple places are all looking for that, and they turn that into XYZ coordinates of the key joints. And they also do that for people's faces, little ping pong balls on people's faces to capture facial expressions. So you can capture automatically somebody moving. When you see a game doing kickboxing, they probably didn't animate that by hand. They probably had a real kickboxer put on the suit, capture the, the motion. Okay. Again, using Guardians of the Galaxy as an example, the raccoon character. Yeah, and I was all set to go and not like this. You know, oh, a raccoon superhero, yes, yeah, sure, right. But they did such a good job with the facial animation, the facial expressions, that after about five or 10 minutes, I found myself suspending disbelief to my embarrassment. Um, but they do that, and they, they'll put little tiny ping pong balls on someone's face, and then as they are acting out the facial expressions, they capture that and then can transfer that to the character. So a whole variety of ways of imparting motion. Textures. <laughs> Textures are taking a pattern, typically an image you got from somewhere, and stretching it over a piece of geometry. For instance, how do you make this flat plane look like it's got a wood veneer on it? Easy. You get a picture of wood, either something you painted, something you computed, something you scanned in. People will take wood or marble and slap it on a scanner and then you stretch it over the object. But again, sometimes you scan these in, sometimes you compute them, sometimes you paint them. But it's a way of adding more detail to a small amount of geometry. Things like the sky in computer games. Typically, it's one flat polygon with sky and clouds painted on it. Lighting. Lighting is an amazingly tricky process. And you'll hear it brought up a lot at SIGGRAPH. We need a mathematical model of light. If we turned off all the lights in here, of course, what would we see? Nothing. It would be pitch black. 
okay? But look around you. We have lights in here. You see patterns on the wall from the lights in the ceiling. Um, you see light coming up here from the, the, the bright lights. When people designed this room, they wanted the lighting to look a certain way. We have lights up here, but they don't appear to be creating bright spots on anything. They're just sort of creating ambient light, light that just bounces around everywhere. If we turned off the really bright lights, you'd still be able to find your way safely to your seat because these are imparting ambient light all around the room. Same thing with the graphics scene. If you put no lights in, well, that's an easy render, it's just black, all black pixels. And so you have the same problems in computer graphics you would have if you were lighting this room or a theater set, is where do I put the lights? How do I keep shadows from falling places where I don't want them? How do I emphasize things? You know, put a spotlight in a certain place. That's pretty interesting. And we'll talk a little more about lighting later on too, but that goes into it. Now I'm, now I'm scared to push the button. And rendering is what brings them all together. You'll hear the word rendering a lot, and it's not obvious always what that means, but basically it means collecting all of this information and producing an image, or a series of images if it's an animation. Okay, and then the final stop on the whole pipeline is output. Okay, where do you put the output? At one point, people had film recorders that they could use the computer to write the output image directly on film. That's typically not the case anymore. Typically it's stored as a digital image, which can then be edited later. It can be composited. You know, you do a lot of things with um, computer graphics backgrounds and computer graphics characters interacting with live action characters, real humans. And so that gets composited, the real human imagery gets composited with the computer graphics imagery. So all of that comes sort of on the output side. Okay, so this is the general process and almost everything you see this week will be somehow framed in there somewhere. All right, graphics hardware. Again, this is why I'm gonna go a little, a little faster than I had intended. We can sort of take that same process and Reblock it like this. Um, this is typically when you see a graph, piece of graphics hardware, say a graphics card you might buy for your Mac or your PC. Um, this is the kind of process it goes through. The big important part of this, I think, is this thing called the frame buffer. The frame buffer is basically a two-dimensional array. Okay, it's a grid, it's like a piece of graph paper. The output of the screen is pixels. Pixel, the word pixel is short for picture element. It's the output, the output is pixels, little teeny dots. If you get up close to your monitor or your color television, you see the little teeny dots. Your parents told you not to get up close to your television, you did it anyway, you know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? But instead of broadcast TV sending pixels into those little dots, we want the computer to fill it instead. And it's the same process we just looked at, those red blocks, same process, only it's sort of broken out a little bit into what computers know how to do. So within that set of pixels are colors. And there's a lot of colors our eyes are capable of seeing, and we don't want to be able to store that many. That would require too many bits of memory. And so years ago, when people were developing color television back in the 1930s, they realized that to a certain approximation, they could use combinations of red, green, and blue to make a lot of different colors. And it works like this, okay? If I have blue and I put it next, a blue dot and I put it next to a green dot, well, if you stand up real close to it, you'll see a blue dot next to a green dot, but if you back up some, your eyes will mush them together. Our eyes are integrating devices. And it'll come out as cyan, or turquoise, as some people would call it. If I had a blue dot and a red dot and I stood back, I would see magenta, kind of a purplish. Now this is the one I find fascinating. If I put a red dot next to a green dot and I back up or I squint my eyes, it'll look yellow. And you know, this doesn't seem to make sense, 
It's a physiological effect of our vision system. Get over it. It works. Next time you're watching television and something yellow comes up on the screen, jump up, run to the screen, look at it real close, and you'll see red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green. It works. We just accept it. And so by doing certain combinations of green and red and blue, we can come up with other colors. And so that's what our monitors do. And thus, that's what our computer graphics does, and thus, that's what our frame buffer knows how to store. So inside the frame buffer, sitting behind each pixel, so this is like one pixel with memory behind it, and no, memory isn't really different colors. They don't actually do that. It's just an illustration. But there's, when they build this, they've got to decide, well, how many bits do I put in this word to hold a red value? Zero would mean no red. All ones in those bits would mean lots of red. And then how many bits for green and how many bits for blue? And there's really nothing that says it has to be the same number. And some low-end systems will use different numbers. Okay? Our eyes are much more sensitive to green than to the other two colors. So if you wanted to do a variable number of bits, you'd put more bits into the green. Followed by green is red. Our eyes are second most sensitive to red. <laughs> Dead last is blue. Only about 11% of our perception of brightness comes from blue. Our eyes really suck at, at looking at shades of blue. Okay, but if you assign certain numbers of bits, well, nobody uses um, uh, less than eight. But if you assign eight bits, say, for red, that means you can get two to the eighth or 256 shades of red. And so this tells you something. If you're looking at a piece of graphics hardware and they say, we've got a 24-bit frame buffer, what that probably means is it's eight for red, eight for green, eight for blue, and that would give you 256 shades of each one of those colors, or of any color. In blue, that's plenty. In red, that's pretty good. In green, it's probably just barely not enough. But again, how much do you care versus the cost? Some of the newer graphic systems are coming out with 10 bits per color component, or 12. And that gives you a lot more, but of course you're using up more memory and it costs more. So again, these are kind of the things you look at what you're trying to do versus what different pieces of graphics hardware are letting you do and decide how it matches up. Something that's been fairly recent is some of these now are doing 32 bits of floating point for red, 32 bits for green, 32 bits for blue. And you think, whoa, that's a lot of memory. And it's, they're doing floating points. So you can do something, something, dot, something, something else. That is, you can put real numbers in there. And you think, why do you want to do that? And the answer is, for visual stuff, it's probably not terribly necessary. However, a lot of algorithms now, very complicated, cool rendering algorithms that are used a lot in interactive games, do some computing and compute colors to put in there. And it turns out for some of those algorithms, you need more than like 8 bits or 10 bits or 12, or your algorithm falls apart. And so that's why it's there. And so when you go, if you go to some of the like real-time rendering courses where they're talking about rendering for games, those are the ones that are really driving having this, what might seem ridiculous amount of resolution, but it's not. Ridic ridiculous amount of color resolution. Another thing frame buffers are capable of doing is storing a transparency value. It's called alpha for no good reason. It's just the first person to write the paper on it used this equation, which is just a blending equation. And they used alpha, and so now it's called alpha blending. But we use it a lot. Um, it's used a lot in scientific visualization. Here's a human heart where the outside is done Transluc translucently, so you can see what's on the inside. It's really just a blending process. Also, there's typically a Z component. There's something called a Z buffer in computer graphics. When you render 3D things, whatever's closest to you should occupy the pixels. Whatever's behind it doesn't occupy those pixels. Now, how does it know? How can it figure that out? There are ways of computing it, but they're ridiculously slow. 
One way computer graphics figured out to do this years ago was to add a depth value into the frame buffer so as you render, it's putting not only the color but the depth. And then when it goes to render something else to that same spot, it compares the depths. The depth of what's already there to the depth of what you're writing, and if what you're writing is closer, it goes ahead and allows the write. If the thing you're writing is farther away, it disallows the write per pixel. And so that's how things can move around in your 3D games, and the thing closest to you will always look like it's in front. Is really nobody's doing any arithmetic, it's all being done like as a switch in the Z buffer. Frame buffers also typically are what's called a double buffered, meaning there's actually two of them. There's one you're writing into as you're computing your scene. There's another one that the viewer is actually allowed to see, okay? The way these frame buffers draw to the screen is the screen has a certain refresh rate, typically 60 times per second. So if you look at a monitor, it looks like that, that image is stable on the monitor, but it's not. It's actually being redrawn 60 times a second, even though it's not changing. If we stopped doing that, then the image would just go away. The screen would go dark, okay? But what if you started in that 60th of a second and the scene wasn't done being created yet? Well, you'd see half a scene or a fourth of a scene or three-fourths of a scene, and it's very hard to suspend disbelief when that happens. So what they do is, they decouple the synchronization, is here's a scene that was already created, it's complete. And every 60th of a second, it gets refreshed out to the monitor. Here's the one you're drawing into, okay? You're doing your geometry, your lighting, your texturing, you're drawing into this one, and only when that one's complete, then your program says, swap the definition of the buffers. Now let the top one be what the user sees, and let the bottom one be what the next frame writes into. Okay, if you're doing high speed dynamics animation and you're buying a graphics card, make sure it's double buffered. Video driver is actually the thing that does the sucking of the pixels out of the frame buffer and sends them to the hardware, sends them to the display. You know, it's a kind of, it's a part of the whole thing that everyone forgets, but it's really important. Um, and then, of course, there's the monitors. And oh my gosh, our monitor's beautiful these days. Um, the big thing just like recently in the last couple months has been talking about 4K resolution monitors, and I'm dying to see them. I, they've got to be on the exhibition floor. Um, I'm dying to get out there and see them. So at one time, monitors were CRTs, cathode ray tubes, you know, the big heavy things with a, that stuck out huge in the back. You have to look really hard now to find one. I had, I had one that was actually in pretty good shape and I wanted to get rid of it so I took it over to Goodwill. You know, gosh, I'll give it to them, make it, maybe they can sell it. And Goodwill refused it. <laughs> oh my gosh, some of my possessions are so old they've been refused by Goodwill. That is really embarrassing. <laughs> so. Everything now is pretty much LCDs. Used to be LCDs and plasma. Plasma seems to be phasing out. LCDs are the big thing. Basically, LCDs are this matrix of red, green, and blue patterns. And there's a light behind it that shines through the patterns. And then there's a switch like a shutter that's opening and closing the light behind each red, green, and blue pattern. So if you leave it open a lot, light gets through and you see, say, bright green. If you leave it closed a lot, then you see a dim green or no green at all. So pretty much everything now seems to be LCD monitors. Yeah, here's plasma. Plasma I thought was cool because basically it was like little neon cells. That is, it actually lit up. Plasmas were really bright, but of course it's very hard to maintain a high resolution display where every little cell is its own light bulb. All right, so resolution, this of course will be a big thing at the, on the exhibition. You know, I wish I could tell you exactly what's there, but I don't know. Um, these are common resolutions. This one's actually pretty low and outdated now. Uh, probably everybody in here, if you've got a laptop, it's doing at least 1600 by 1200. Um, this is what people used to call 2K resolution, even though it wasn't exactly 2K. 
Probably we're going to see some monitors out there that are doing this, 4096 by 2160. The aspect ratio is important. Televisions, like your parents and your grandparents had, were, started out as four by three, four wide by three high. And the reason was our eyes are separated horizontally. We can see more horizontally than we can see vertically, and so they did a screen to, to match. Nowadays, most monitors seem to be, well, they, some of them are still four to three or five to four, but most of them are 16 to nine. And the reason is that's cinema format. That was the, re, the, the aspect ratio that movie makers settled on a long time ago. And so when the monitors don't match that, You've probably seen, you're watching a movie at home on a four, to four by three monitor and you get black bars on the top or black bars on the side. That's because the movie is 16 by nine, but it's trying to fit it into a four by three. So a lot of monitors now are just 16 by nine, so they match the movie. Oop, yeah. Um, yeah, and our, our human acuity, our acuity is our ability to distinguish two things as being separate things, okay? If I put a couple of dots, took a Sharpie and do a couple of dots on the back wall, those of you sitting in the back could turn around and look at them and say, oh yeah, it's two dots. But those of us in the front would look at them and go, hmm, kind of looks like one dot. The way you know that is if you have 20-20 vision, your ability to distinguish two things is an arc minute, roughly. That's a 60th of a degree. So if the two things are closer together than a 60th of a degree coming off your head, then you see it as one thing, not two things. Well, this is nice to know this because you can actually figure this out. If you know how far you're gonna be from the monitor, you can figure out how small the pixels have to be, a little trigonometry, to make it so you can't see the pixels. It just looks like one mush of color. Or working it backwards, you can say, if I've got a screen of a certain resolution and the pixels are a certain size, how far back do I have to let my audience be in order that they see a mush of colors, not individual dots? All right, upstream from that, the last thing to touch the frame buffers is called the fragment processor. Fragments, this confused me for a long time, fragments and pixels are essentially the same thing. A pixel is a final RGB that's being written out final red, green, blue combination. A fragment is a pixel to be, as one of my students put it. It's a pixel to be, you've got all the information, you just haven't computed the red, green, blue yet. So that tells you what the fragment processor's job is, is to take in all this information and compute the final red, green, blue. It goes and looks up lighting, it goes and looks up textures, it goes and performs algorithms, it does lots of stuff, it's cool. Upstream from that is something called the rasterizer. It produces pixels. What comes into the geometry is typically triangles, things that are bounded by vertices and are fairly big that occupy multiple pixels. Well, you know, imagine you take out a piece of graph paper and you draw a triangle and now you want to color it in and so you start looking at it and coloring in the squares on the graph paper. That's essentially what the rasterizer does. It's a big interpolation engine. It's cleverer than that in that if it just does that, you get these stair steps. Um, in signal processing, this is called aliasing. It means something is undersampled. And in computer graphics, they went ahead and adopted that term as well. So when you have a line that's for, fairly shallow, you can really see the stair steps. You've all seen them. Um, that's aliasing, and so if you want to make it smoother, you do something called anti-aliasing, which means you do some graying out along the boundary. You smooth it, and some of the graphics hardware will do that. It's built in. You simply turn it on. It slows down your display a little bit, but you can now um, get smoother lines. So if you look at it, so here it is with no anti-aliasing, here it is with one level, and here it is with a, a better level. But you can see that where it's blue and white, it's now doing shades of blue, and where it's black and white, it's now doing shades of gray. And so when you 
course, up close like this, it looks like, well, shades of gray, but stepping back, it looks like a much smoother edge. If you're doing a display where you've got sharp boundaries, computer-aided design, air traffic control, anti-aliasing is a must. Those stair steps drive you crazy when you look at them all day. And rasterizers can interpolate other things. They can interpolate colors and smooth out color um, boundaries across an object. They can interpolate the Z, the depth values. They can interpolate the alpha, the translucency values. They really are fairly intelligent. You know, I call them an interpolation engine, but they really are a lot more intelligent than that. Here's textures. Again, we get a wood texture. That geometry is just a four-sided quadrilateral, but it's got a wood texture on it, so it looks more detailed than it really is. You can do all kinds of things. Here's a map of Oregon using a satellite image. Here's a map of the United States, or a map of the world, where he's using the textures to represent the intensity of heights. Here's a texture where it's showing fluid flow by smearing a white noise. The fragment processor really can do neat stuff. And one of the cool things that goes on in graphics now is you can put your own code there. You can write your own code and drop it into the fragment processor. Here's the Mendelbrot set. You can put the Mendelbrot set equation in there and go zoom in on it. That's kind of fun. For things like that, you know, I talked about how, oh my gosh, we've got floating point precision in the frame buffer. If you do the Mendelbrot zoom and use floating point, which sounds like a lot, it sounds like overkill, it doesn't take very long before you get this blockiness. And that's because you've run out of, resol of um, resolution in the digits in the floating point. Like, oh my gosh, we actually did that? If you, whoop, I just don't have it. If you go to double precision, then that gets smooth again. And so a lot of the frame buffers now will store double precision and the processor's internal, the graphics card will do double precision arithmetic, not for computing colors necessarily, but for some of these algorithms. <clears throat> and then upstream of that is the vertex processor. Objects come in as combinations of vertices, points. You wanna transform them, you wanna, you, know, you, you wanna rotate them, you wanna scale them, you wanna move them around. That all happens up here in the vertex processor. And again, that's programmable, so you can do very interesting things. Oh, the projection is done there too. Do you want it to be orthographic, where all the lines remain parallel, or do you want them to have a vanishing point? That's called perspective. Here's what it looks like in real images. This, of course, is how we see things in real life. Things get smaller as they get farther away. Here it is with orthographic or parallel. It looks weird, but we use it sometimes when we're designing geometry because we can compare sizes of things that are deep in the scene with sizes of things that are in the front. And what's cool is you can write your own vertex code and put that in the vertex processor, which means you can do nonlinear stuff, okay? This is part of a dome projection, doing computer graphics on the surface of a planetarium dome. Well, it's a big fisheye lens to get things out to the planetarium dome, which is a distortion. So what you do is you program the inverse of the distortion in your vertex processor. So teapots come out looking like this, but when they get projected through the fisheye lens, they look correct. This is a lot of fun. All right, that's the quick hardware. Let's move on to modeling. As I said, we would talk about the geometry aspects of this, is you look around you and you see chairs and podiums and water glasses and things like that. If I wanted to make a computer graphic scene, I would have to somehow describe these things in, in such a way that it's a digital representation that the computer can in, interpret, okay? People talk about using mathematical models. Now, what does that mean? Well. A model is something you can use to ask questions about something else, okay? So if I have a mathematical model of the chair you're sitting on, when the computer wants to go draw a picture of that, it can start asking questions. If I'm looking there, what color am I gonna find? 
If I'm looking there, how deep is that? Okay, what's its geometry? Okay, so these are mathematical models people build. By and large, most of the things you see are made up of triangles. Most of the things you see in computer graphics are made up of triangles. The person designing them may have a higher level way of thinking about it, but typically by the time they hit the rendering part of whatever you're using, hardware or software, it's a list of triangles, okay? And so here is the, the Stanford bunny, and in this picture, the, they've shrunk each triangle, so you can kind of get a sense for something smooth. How many triangles do you actually need? Now, it's really pretty amazing. Now, this is why when you look at graphics cards and you say, oh my God, there's two gigabytes of memory on this, why? Well, part of it is, is because you want to store a lot of geometry out there and move it around. Now, how do you store that? You know, there, we can get into a whole discussion of data structures, but we're not. Typically, the way, if you've got something defined as a whole bunch of triangles or a whole bunch of quadrilaterals, typically the way you do it is you number the vertices, and then for each vertex, you've got an X, Y, Z. So there's eight vertices, and then there's eight X, Y, Z's going on. Typically, at every vertex, you've also got a color. So there's eight vertices, there's eight colors, and each one of these is a combination of red, green, and blue. And typically, those color components are defined as zero point to one point. They're not usually stored that way, or they're not always stored that way but we define them that way so that it's easy to get certain interpolations of color, knowing that underneath the driver and the hardware will actually map zero to one into whatever range the device really knows about. And then, see, so we've got colors at the vertices, we've got coordinates at the vertices, what else do we need? We need to know the connections. So here we're saying we've got six quadrilaterals, and the first one consists of a connection from point zero to point two to point three to point one. Okay, this is a mathematical model of a cube. Anything the computer wants to know in order to draw the cube, it can get from this combination of numbers. Where is it? How's it connected? And what color is it? And so if I pass this into a program that then knows about that, I'll get this. And I've also turned on the color interpolation switch so that it interpolates in colors in between the vertices. Okay? Now, unfortunately, in real life, very few of us get to model with cubes. And so things get much more complicated from there. But the principle is still the same. You're modeling coordinates, you're modeling connections, and you're modeling appearances, color, alpha, texture values. All of that goes into the geometry model. Now I mentioned that oftentimes we don't want to deal with those little teeny triangles. That's really hard to control. If I'm trying to sculpt that bunny to make it look a little more bunny-ish, if that's a word, I don't want to start to sculpt 50,000 triangles, okay? So there's some higher level things we can do. Here's one of them. There's something called Boolean geometry. Now, from high school, do you all remember Venn diagrams? Okay, a circle, another circle. The union is the outer edge. The intersection is the slice that's common to both. We can do the same thing. Let's suppose that we wanted to have this. For some reason, we wanted a block with a circular hole pushed through it. That's pretty hard to sculpt with nothing but little triangles. Instead, what we can do is we can use a geometry modeling piece of software that knows about Booleans, 3D Venn diagrams, and say, well, let's have a block, let's have a cylinder, and let's say subtract. Okay, or we could say intersect, what's common to both, and we'd get this. Or we could say union, that's like the outer circles in the 2D Venn diagrams. Now, how do you draw this? The software then breaks this down into teeny, teeny triangles. But we didn't. We didn't have to do that. 
we could deal with it at a higher level of abstraction. So you'll see geometric modeling software packages on the exhibition floor, and that's kind of the interesting part about it, um, is what level of abstraction are they letting you deal with it at? That is, how are you doing it to avoid having to produce those teeny tiny triangles yourself? Another one that's pretty cool is curve sculpting. There's something in mathematics, computer graphics mathematics, called a Bezier curve, and this is the equation, which we don't care about. But what this is basically is, is if I give you four points, zero, one, two, three, and I plug them into this equation, and I vary this parameter t from zero to one, like point one, point two, point three, point four, I will get points along this smooth curve, okay? Now, the significance of this is nowhere does this require you to vary t from zero to one in any particular increment. So if I want a fairly coarse curve that's fast to draw, that I can sculpt, that is by moving those four points around, I make delta t point one. If I'm making, redoing that curve because I want to make it part of a really good rendering, I make delta t point oh oh one. That is, the resolution can be determined by you anytime you want. No, I like this. Well, curves, of course, are one thing, and it's fun because you can sculpt them and you can make pictures. So, for instance, the top of the smile is done by these four curves. The bottom of the smile is done by these four curves. And as I push those points around, the curves move with them. And it's very much like sculpting, digital sculpting. Okay, now that's 2D, or, real, or really a 1D curve. Where it gets really fun is you can do this with surfaces. So here's a Bezier surface, and again, the, the equation's not important, the concept is. The concept is exactly the same, except in the surface world, there are 16 points you're allowed to control, you're allowed to move around. And so you get in there with your 3D input device and grab one and pick it up and move it, and the surface undulates to kind of follow those points. And now you've really got something. Now if you're trying to divide, define something that's got this smoothness to it, a face, uh, an airplane fuselage, a boat hull, things like that, a sculpture, you can do that without having to deal at the teeny tiny triangle level. And again, you'll see a lot of this in the geometry modeling on the exhibition floor. Okay, we will help you sculpt your cool alien monster character that you want for your game or, or your movie animation. And then underneath, it breaks it into the teeny tiny triangles just in time for the graphics system to draw them. Now, as long as you've got the geometry in there, if you care, you can use this for analysis, that is, I can automatically get the computer to put contour lines there. So if I'm a landscape architect and I'm sculpting this surface because I want to make that part of a, a park, and I can see where the contour lines are, show me how steep this is, will the water run off correctly? And to make that sort of analysis even easier, you can ask the computer questions. Show me the curvature of this. Well, okay, this means that right here it's fairly flat the way I've sculpted it, it's a fairly flat part of the surface. Here it curves pretty quickly. Because of that, water would collect there. So you can analyze the geometry too. That's one of the advantages of computational geometry. Yes, you can render, but you can also ask questions about it. Here's kind of a cool way to do it. You have some geometry and you put this lattice, this mesh around it, and then you sculpt the mesh. Not the, not the 3D geometry, but the 3D geometry just sort of comes along for the ride. And then, of course, there's other analyses that I mentioned earlier that involve simulation. So here we have an object. Here we have the object exploding. And it comes right out of the geometry. You've just said, ultimately, I want to explode this, so be sure to have it able to be broken into pieces that can fly apart. As I said, you'll never watch a movie the same way again. 
All right, let's stop for a moment. <laughs> Any questions so far? You can either shout them out and I'll repeat the question or you can go to a microphone. Stunned silence. I've had that reaction at SIGGRAPH too, especially during the electronic theater. All right, well, let's move on to rendering. This is the process of taking geometry and all the information around it and drawing a picture of something, filling a frame buffer full of pixels. Okay. There are ways that people attempt to make renderings look photorealistic, look like exactly the real object down to the most minute detail. And that's fun to do, like for a, a single image. But by and large, we don't want to do that because it takes too long to compute. You know, games, they have to regenerate a scene every, 60 every 60th of a second. That's the refresh rate. If it takes longer than that, the user sees it as chunky. Okay, it doesn't look like it's very smooth. So we can't do it there. And movies, movies are on a deadline. Okay, the rendering companies have got to get that animation done and rendered into pixels by a certain date. So by and large, we, 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 we try and see how much good we can get without going overboard and um, exceeding the amount of time we've allotted for producing the image, which really means you do this, is you say, well, what is it I'm trying to convey? Do I really need hundreds of lights in the ceiling for my computer graphics image? Knowing that every light is gonna incur its own arithmetic for lighting. Well, you know, probably not. Do I need these two big lights on the side? Eh, probably yes, and that sort of thing. So you really look at your scene and you say, and you know, what you're trying to do, and say, well, what is it I'm trying to convey? And then you sort of back from that and say, What's, what do I need to put in there? But no more. Okay, so let's look at some of what those issues are. First of all, computer graphics lighting is interesting. Objects have an inherent color. This object is blue. Well, why is it blue? We think it's blue because when it absorbs light, it absorbs, it keeps inside reds and greens and lets blues come back out. Okay, that's why objects appear to have a certain color. Here's a light. Lights have a color too. Okay, these lights are sort of, these are incandescent, so they're sort of yellowish. Okay, but why does it look yellowish? It's because it's emitting light in the red-green part of the spectrum and not emitting any light in the blue. Okay, so you've got these two characteristics. What light, what wavelengths are coming in and then what wavelengths is this object able to bounce out? And so what you'll actually end up seeing is, well, what they do is they take the three light components and multiply, red, green, blue, and multiply them by each of the object color components, red, green, blue, and then those three products are what you'll actually see. And you know this to be true. Right? Have you ever gone to a city where, like San Diego, where all the, the downtown lights are a, a very deep yellow and you park your blue car in the parking lot in the afternoon and then you come back after dark and you can't find it because you're looking around and I don't see any blue car here. Well, that's because your car is blue because it only is able to reflect blue. The street lights are yellow because they're bringing out reds and greens. Your car looks black. There is no blue to give it in order to reflect it. And that's the math, basically, of light interacting with objects. It's a little more complicated than that, but I, th I think you get the sense of all this stuff matters. And so if I put together a scene that looks like this, this is with a white light, and then I change it to a green light, I get something like this. Okay. And so the graphic systems take this into account. Now, how do we make things look like they're lit? 
Again, you can get right down to the atomic level and figure it out and model all the photons, and some people do that, but we're gonna try not to. So if you see something in a game, say something interactive on a, on a desktop computer, or even now your cell phone, 3D on your cell phone, how do they make that lighting work? Okay, in that world there are three components of lighting. <clears throat> something called ambient, something called diffuse, something called specular. Okay, first of all let's draw a picture of our scene. Here's the eye, or the camera. Here's where a light is, and there could be again hundreds of these if we're modeling the ceiling in this room. Here's the point we're looking at. This is the point we're gonna compute the lighting of. Here's the surface normal, which is the perpendicular to the surface right there. Here's an angle, we'll get back to that. Here's another angle, we'll get back to that. So we need to know the geometry, not only of the objects, but the geometry of the scene. Where things are, where's the light, where's the eye. All right, here are the three components. Ambient, ambient is light that's everywhere. Okay, if you look at the rug in the room, what do you see? You see a rug. If there was no light shining on that rug, we would see the floor as black. But do you see any shadows on the rug? Probably not. That's because by the time light gets to the rug in this room, it's been bouncing around off of everything, finally arrives there from all different directions, and simply lights it up. When light comes from a, a certain direction, you get a shadow. Like, oh, here's a shadow, okay? But the light on the rug is just kind of there. That's called ambient, okay? When scenes don't have ambient, they look a little weird. If I was rendering this room and didn't turn on any ambient, the rug would be black, okay? Here's diffuse. Diffuse comes about, let's go back to the diagram. Diffuse comes about by looking at this angle, the angle between the incoming light and the surface normal. If that angle is zero, we get bright light. You're shining the flashlight perpendicular to the surface, okay? When that angle's not zero, we're angling the flashlight to the surface and the spot there is dimmer, okay? We can compute that. In fact, if you work out the math, the trig, it turns out it's the cosine of that angle, which again, you don't have to know because hardware and software will do that sort of thing for you. And so, so here's the teapot with just ambient. Here's the teapot with just diffuse. And so here's where you get kind of the shading around the edges. It's really diffuse that gives us the sense of the overall, the curvature of the object, okay? Here we can't really tell, but here we can. We can really get a sense of the subtle differences. Now, the third thing is called specular. And specular works like this. Specular is kind of a shininess. Okay, given again the carpet as an example, the carpet is not shiny. Now, if I shine the laser pointer down on the carpet, it's not bouncing from there and hitting the ceiling. If I put something very shiny on the floor, like a piece of polished metal, and pointed the laser pointer at it, you'd see a laser dot up on the ceiling. It would bounce, okay? So there's a theta here on the other side. Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. The bounce would go along here. If my eye or the camera was along that ray, I would see a big burst of reflected light. And if I move my eye away from that reflected ray, I will see less and less of that reflected light. That's specular. And there's, it really gets down to some mathematical distribution of probabilities, and there's ways to approximate that quickly. And so on the teapot example, this is just the specular part. Just the part along that perfect ray, plus or minus a certain amount, gets reflected light. You combine them and you get something like this, okay? We see the diffuse to give us the sense of the overall. We give us the ambience so that if things are not directly touched by light, they're not black. 
and we see the specular highlights to give us the sense of shininess or smoothness. This is how to do lighting quickly. There are people that study lighting, that do all kinds of physics, optics experiments, and that's, I think it's fascinating. They come up with equations that are huge, and their images are just amazing. And if you want to do that, you can, and there's a lot of information on there, out there on how to do it. However, most of the time we're trying to do something that's good and fast. You can have light sources in various types. There's a point light. Here the point light is right up here, and like the name implies, it's light is just spreading out from the point. If I held a light bulb in my hand, that's a point light. Light is spreading out from the, the light bulb. We can put in a parallel light. You know, we, we consider the rays of the sun to be parallel, even though they're not but 93 million miles away. Okay, they seem parallel. <clears throat> Notice the shadow is smaller. Well, that's because light's not spreading out like the point light did. They're all coming in at an angle, the same angle. And then you can do spotlights as well. You know, like these lights we have here on the sides, um, they will create kind of a bright spot on the floor, and then there's an angle at which they stop. That is the cone that goes around the light is stopped, and you can adjust that. So you can play around with different kinds of lights to get different effects. And just like lighting, a, say, a theater set, you do that in computer graphics scenes as well. Oh, we want so much ambient, we want some diffuse, we want a spotlight over here, we want another light over there because we don't want the actor's face in a shadow. You play the same games using computer graphics. All right, there's a couple different kinds of rendering. One where you start at the object, one where you start at the eye. The object, ones that start at the object, by and large are the ones that are on graphics hardware. Okay, here's an object. We're gonna render it into pixels. We're gonna turn it into pixels. We're gonna use a Z buffer so that things behind get overwritten by things in front. And we have a 3D scene. There's another interesting way that you'll hear about, and it's called radiosity, and there's some other variations on that. And what's cool about it is it models light bouncing around. You've probably done this. You're wearing a bright red sweater, you stand next to a white wall, and you see a little pink on the wall. Basically, everything in this room is its own light source. Light hits something, bounces out, it's its own light source, okay? You can put that into one huge, massive set of equations and solve them together. And the effects are dramatic. Okay, slow to compute, but dramatic. This was really, this really came about from research originally done at Cornell University. But again, look at, look at some of the subtlety here. Okay, you see all this kind of bleeding of light from one object to another. That's what makes this so cool. You get that very subtle bleeding of light from one to another. You don't see rigid outline shadows, which isn't realistic, okay? I think, I think radiosity is just very cool. Then there's another set of things that start at the eye, and the big one in this category is ray tracing. In ray tracing, you model the screen as a, a, a grid of pixels. You pretend to put it in front of the eye. And then you fire a bullet through each pixel and hit the object. Okay. Now, whatever it hits, whatever it hits first, there's probably other objects back here, but whatever it hits first would be the color you would paint in that pixel. And if that's all there was to ray tracing, we wouldn't do it. You know, that's just not enough benefit for the pain of trying to deal with the scene one pixel bullet at a time. So what else could you do? Well, we can do shadows, arbitrary shadows on weird looking surfaces simply by starting here and firing another bullet. Fire another bullet towards the light sources and if something, anything is in the way, that means this light source doesn't get to that, uh, that point, and it must be in a shadow. Okay, that's kind of cool, because it doesn't have to be flat objects. It could be anything. All right, but it gets even cooler. 
supposing this is a reflective object, a mirror. We fire the bullet, we do angle of reflection equals angle of incidence, and we see what it sees. And so now we draw into there, not the color of the object we hit, but the color of the object that we reflected and hit. And it gets even better because we can do refraction. We fire the bullet, we hit an object, it's a translucent refractive object, you know, the pencil and the glass of water effect. We bend light and now that's the color we put in that pixel. And it makes it look like these are all exclusive, but in fact what really happens is the bullet hits an object and it breaks into several bullets. There might be some that are looking for the light sources to see about shadows. There might be one that does a reflection, might be one that does a refraction. You know, because translucent objects typically do both. They both reflect and refract. And then they bring their colors back and they combine them all. So some of the really dramatic pictures you can get, like here's, here's using a, a glass marble. Um, this is ray tracing. So there's a mirror, there's shadows, this object has bumps and you can see them in the shadows, and then refraction through the glass marble. It's acting like a lens. So some of the really dramatic, shiny, sparkly images you see are ray tracing. And one of the hot areas in graphics now is using code on the graphics card to do very fast ray tracing. People refer to it as real-time ray tracing. Well, you know, anybody can do real-time ray tracing. You just use a very small amount of detail in your scene. So real time means nothing. However, very fast ray tracing, now that means something a little more. You'll see, you'll see that. So that's kind of neat. There's another object called subsurface scattering. You notice that the ambient diffuse specular model makes things kind of have a plasticky look. A lot of things don't do that. Skin, you know, milk, wax. What they do is they take light, light bounces around inside them and comes out somewhere else and there are ways of mathematically modeling that, and you get things like this, kind of a waxy impression, and that's called subsurface scattering. All right, let's do animation. One way of animating is to simply do articulated models, okay? One of the cool, cool things about having a career in computer graphics is you can have your own set of tinker toys in your office, and nobody thinks twice about it. Okay, that's a very good advantage. But if you've played with Tinker Toys, you already know this. You've got them hooked up here. The yellow piece is meant to be stationary. I can change these three angles and make the whole thing articulate like a robot. You know, okay, here's transformers on a budget. Okay, let's do this. Oops. So if I told you the lengths of these things and how they were connected and what these three angles are, we can compute using the mathematics of trigonometry and transformations, we can compute where the objects are, the green, red, and blue pieces are. So basically that is how they do things like transformers, is they're playing with those angles and the computer is putting things in the right place to make them look connected. And if you're trying to make things move smoothly, Instead of giving one value for the three thetas, you give a range. Theta one goes from zero to 90 in 50 steps, something like that. And now the whole thing moves smoothly in 50 steps. There's a converse of this called inverse kinematics. That first one is called either forward kinematics or hierarchical kinematics. Inverse kinematics is you work the problem backwards. You say, I want the tip of this blue piece to be right there. What angles do I need to put in to make that happen? This is a little trickier. It's a nonlinear set of equations that typically have to be solved iter iteratively. Okay? But it's really important. Think about walking. Think about animating somebody walking or a tinker toy walking. If all I could do was do the joint angles, making it look like the foot actually hit the floor would be kind of tricky. With inverse kinematics, you say, 
The foot's on the floor. <laughs> Go ahead and figure out the angles that made that happen. Okay. And so, and, and you, you actually at SIGGRAPH, you won't hear people talk about inverse kinematics. They'll call it IK. I don't know, I guess, I guess if you're cool, you always use the abbreviations. Okay, so you'll hear somebody, oh, we used IK on that. That's what they mean. They worked it backwards to get those joint angles. Particle systems, particles are everywhere. Waterfalls, fireworks, fire, clouds, sprays, all kinds of things. Do you remember the Pixar movie Cars? There was that, wa that wonderful waterfall scene. That was a massive particle system. Okay, the Sandman and the, that one Spider-Man movie particle system. They are everywhere. It's basically modeling some phenomenon with thousands and thousands of particles that have certain properties. Ah, so you can do, kind of, well, firework explosions. The idea is this, is you emit particles and then you let some sort of math drive what they do. They might go a certain direction, they might bounce off of things, they might be fuzzy, like if you're doing a waterfall or something like that, and then you keep updating them according to some mathematics that you've decided based on what they're supposed to be looking like, what they're supposed to be modeling. You know, one of my grad students wanted to do spraying water, so he was playing with particle systems. Again, it's, it's, it's impressively easy to get started. What I tell my students is, what's hard is getting out of it. Because you always realize, God, 10 more minutes of programming, I could do some really cool things. And so like 10 years later, you're still working on it. Okay? You've heard it here first. When you get into a particle system program, it is very tough to extract yourself from it. <clears throat> Physics, you know, springs especially have a very nice physical motion. Okay, if you double the force, you double the stretch. A lot of things can be modeled with springs, meshes of springs. Something like this can be used to model a chain, depending on how we set the stiffness and the masses. But I can do this, build the math of a system of springs into it, and then shake the top, and the rest of it will behave correctly. And this is really neat. Because if I was trying to move all these points convincingly to make it look like a chain being shaken, I doubt I could do it. So instead, I do the one thing I can do, shake the top, and everything else comes along for the ride in a convincing way, in a convincing physical way. We can put, bound or put um, objects in there, physical barriers. We can crank this up a dimension. Instead of doing a 1D mesh of springs, do a two-dimensional mesh of springs. We now have a cloth simulator. So in games and animations, when you see flags flying or people's clothing, you know, clothing's a big deal in a lot of movies and games because you don't want to animate the cloth. You don't want to animate the wrinkling, the bending of the cloth. What you want to do is animate the character in the cloth. So if you can figure out a way to make the cloth follow the laws of physics and come along for the ride, then you've really got something. You can do a lot more cool detail without having to crank up your level of effort to something really extreme. And again, you can do physical barriers. This is kind of fun. You know, you see pleats on curtains. You don't have to ever model pleats on curtains. If you put in a rectangular mesh of these springs and just give it a shake, the pleats form automatically. The pleats are actually part of the innate physics. I find that just kind of neat and unexpected. <clears throat> and so people, you'll see this in SIGGRAPH, you'll see this built into programs like Blender and Maya and so on, where you simply say, here's a table, put the cloth here, let it fall, okay, now I have a convincing tablecloth without you having to do all the modeling to make that happen. Again, here's clothing, here's curtains. People also do it in 3D to model things like Jello. I don't know about you, I don't run into Jello animation very often. And then there's this really cool thing called functional animation. 
um, where you want objects to go a certain way, you want them to go to a certain target, but you don't want to animate them there. That's just too painful. Okay, you could never make it look smooth. You could never make it look like realistic motion. This, sometimes this is done for crowd modeling. Okay, maybe I'm gonna tell the front half of the crowd, I want you to go to the back wall. The back half of the crowd, I want you to come to the front. Ready, go. Don't really, don't really do that. Okay, but what would happen? Well, you'd all kind of work through each other. You'd sidestep each other. You're attracted to where you're supposed to be going but you've got constraints because you don't want to hit each other. And that would make a certain kind of motion, which we really would rather not animate by hand. I would rather not take each one of you and determine your path that gets you there avoiding other people. I would rather the computer do that for me. And so this is really fun. What you do is you say, well, here's the particle. Here's, here's, here's the person, maybe. Here's where the person's trying to go. Let's pretend we have a spring pulling the person to the target. And then this is a damper. This is something that just smooths it out, that takes energy out of the system. It's like a shock absorber in a car. Okay, ready, go. Well, what that would do, depending on the stiffness of the spring and the value of the shock absorber, it would cause this particle to automatically move towards its target. Cool. I didn't have to do anything other than say where I am and where I'm trying to go and some parameters about how fast I'm gonna get there. But now supposing I did that with all of these. Okay, they're now gonna try and avoid each other. I don't want them to hit each other. What can you do? Well, in the same way that right here, we were making up fake forces, let's make up some more fake forces. And the fake forces we're gonna make up is, let's have a repulsive coefficient. I suppose when you're talking about people, the word repulse means something else. But in physics, it means pushing away from, okay? And so you can make something that's proportional to a constant and inversely proportional to the distance between them. That is, if I'm trying to get through you, as you and I get closer and closer, the forces trying to prevent us from hitting each other get bigger and bigger. Now you combine these two. Each object, each person is drawn to their target, but they're pushing away from other people. And you do that, and you get stuff like this. So if I pick a certain stiffness for those springs, like how badly do I want to get to the target, each of the particles goes like this. If I increase the stiffness even more, it does this sort of stuff. It gets a little more desperate. So you can kind of see here, it desperately goes around something now. I go, it's going this way. It desperately goes around something now, trying to get to the target. And again, I didn't have to animate it. Yet things are moving fairly smoothly, and they're doing what I wanted them to do. You know, and actually, I don't really care about the path as long as it's convincing. So this kind of stuff is really fun, and it's really common in computer graphics that people try and figure out a way to only supply the information they really want to supply and let the computer sort of fill in some of the details we don't care as much about. Oh, we can play with the repulsion forces. Here things, with a little small repulsion force, things go fairly directly. With big repulsion forces, they try very hard to go around other people. And then finally, here's the other part of animation that you'll see a lot of, or you'll see on the exhibition floor, called motion capture, or mocap for short, no one calls it motion capture. So it's called mocap, and here are cameras that are looking down on somebody going through motion. You know, the cameras are these special, sometimes these special infrared things, um, and they have dots on people's faces or ping pong balls on the suit, and by having multiple cameras, the cameras will bring back an X, Y, Z for each one of the dots or each one of the ping pong balls, which can then be fed back into the geometry modeling to move things around. A game with a kickboxer. Nobody animated that by hand like the angles in the Tinker Toys. They didn't do that, this is too hard. They did motion capture, fed those points back in, fed those angles back in, and went from there. 
Similarly, there's also things that attach to you. Um, these are called data gloves or cyber gloves. And they've got sensors essentially at every joint on your hand. And so if you're trying to animate a character who's doing things with their hand, the articulation of the hand is important for the storytelling, for the animation, this is wonderful. Like if you're having a, a character, in this case, play the piano. Okay, very tough to animate by hand. Very nice to say to someone who knows how to play the piano, let me record your motion and I'll play it back. So you'll see a lot of this. So, what we've looked at, <laughs> what we've looked at is a very, very touchy slide advancer. <clears throat> what we've looked at are some of the pieces of computer graphics, you know, like the modeling, rendering, animation, some of the sub pieces, like the lighting. So in the modeling, we've looked at some of the higher level abstractions that people use. Um, for the animation, we've looked at some shortcuts that let you do less work but still get the motion you want. And this is what you'll see all week. Sometimes you'll just see the end effect, leaving you to wonder how it was done and marvel at it. But sometimes the point of the paper or the talk or the piece of equipment on the exhibition floor is to tell you how to do it and tell you how do you would do it yourself. So thank you all for coming this morning. It's been great having you here. This is going to be one of the coolest weeks of your life, so I hope you enjoy it. And I'll be happy to stick around and answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs>